Uh, two parts of this passage here. One that says, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church. One of the unfortunate things in English is we lose the impact of that verse. Yeah. Because when Jesus first said it, it would have sounded like this. Peter, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. There was no ambiguities there in the Aramaic. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the Greek it lost a little because it went from Petra to Petros. Mm -hmm. And then in English it really lost it because now we've got Peter and rock. It's yeah. totally divorced. Yeah. But originally it was, Peter, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Same, there yeah. was no question about that. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I brought this rock with me tonight. I'm so amazed you have that here. Yeah. Three weeks ago I was in Caesarea Philippi. We made the trip up beyond north of Galilee up to Caesarea Philippi where Jesus made that statement in Matthew 16. Ever since becoming a Catholic, that was somewhere I wanted to go and to sit and to think and pray and read and look at that area. For Jesus, it would have been a good two-day journey through the mountains. It was not a light thing that he did to go up there. He went there for a purpose. He didn't grab a bus. He didn't grab a bus and there was no McDonald's <laughs> along the way to eat either. He had a rough journey. There were um, wild animals and everything else. But he went up there in order to make that pronouncement to Peter because of that unique environment. Right now at that rock, when you go to Caesarea Philippi, there's a huge rock. It's about 500 feet long and 200 feet high and it kind of overhangs you. Mm. And on the center, right in the left, there's a huge cave, which at the time of Jesus, there was, they could never find a bottom to it. They would always lower ropes down, but they could never find a bottom. And that was considered to be the jaws of death. That's where the gates of hell, the gates of the netherworlds were there. And they turned that into a center of, God, of pagan worship. Now in regards to the rock, one of the interesting things is, on that rock was a temple to the divine Caesar Augustus. It was built there. Herod had built it there for Caesar in appreciation for some favors. So here Jesus is at this rock the false rock with a false temple to a false god. And he says, Peter, we're going to do something different now. You are the true rock, and on this rock I will build the true temple, the true church, and the gates of hell here will not prevail against it. They used to throw, the pagans would throw sacrifices into this cave, and there was a spring. And as the water would rush out underneath, that was the source of the Jordan River. came right out of this cave. If you think of that in implication of Peter as well, that out of this rock came the water that watered all of Israel. All of God's people were watered from the spring that came out of that rock. So Peter now being the rock, the false temple's gone, the true church is being built on Peter, and the water that comes from the church waters God's people. It sustains them. And this gates of hell now would not prevail. When the pagans threw the sacrifices into this cave, if the blood came out in the stream, it meant that God had rejected the sacrifice. But in Christianity, it's the opposite. When the sacrifice of Jesus was made, it's when the blood was flowing that God did accept the sacrifice. So here we've got this great scenario. I, it's very sad that most commentaries do not bring out this issue. They don't bring out the, All those the background of Caesarea Philippi. It's exciting to think that there was no question to the apostles all these symbolisms, oh, no, they knew. or to the ones they taught, no. the early church fathers. They understood. It was there. But when we have forgotten history, when mm -hmm. we've lost track of all of that, mm -hmm. or when we say the Bible alone, separate from all that stuff, then we're, we miss all those great symbolisms. Right. Not only that, but we're Gentiles. Yeah. <laughs> the majority of Christians in American Catholics are Gentiles. The Jews understood these things. The Jews in Israel understood not only all the implications of the temple and the sacrifices, but they understood Caesarea Philippi. Right there now there's a plaque put there by the Israeli government that said that this site with the mountain and the caves and everything is a, was a singular site in all the Judeo, all the Greco-Roman world. Hmm. So Jesus went there for that specific purpose. Wow. Can I tell you about the keys of the kingdom too? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> At the same time, Jesus then shifts to point B, the second point, where he is now telling Peter that he's giving him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Which, what does that mean? Is it just a clever little saying? But that is all the Jewish listeners would understand what he meant. And when you go back in the Jewish Old Testament, there are passages there about the royal steward of the kingdom who carried the keys for the king. And whatever he opened would stay opened, and whatever he locked would stay locked. 
He had access to the treasury, to the city gates. He could exclude people from the city. He could include people into the kingdom. He had power delegated to him by the king. So when Jesus says this to Peter, there's a lot going on there at that point. He is delegating Peter to a position of the steward of the kingdom. Remember that in David's time, the Davidic kingdom, and it was promised that it would be eternal. And all the kings after David, there was an office of royal steward, and those royal stewards carried the keys of the kingdom. But in around 700 B.C., the kingdom came to an end when Babylon took the Jews away to Babylon and the Davidic kingdom ceased. It ended. But what did Gabriel say to Mary in the Gospel of Luke? She said, your offspring will inherit the throne of David and his kingdom will be an eternal kingdom. So what does Jesus do? He reestablishes the kingdom of David. And as the new king of Israel, of the eternal kingdom, what does he do? He appoints his new steward over his kingdom and delegates him the keys of the kingdom with the power to bind and to loose and to control the everyday judicial legislative areas of his kingdom.